Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Cloney, as you heard, and I'm from a small startup called Sixdorf Space, based out in Israel. And we're developing a kind of novel approach to doing high-speed Sixdorf tracking that's much less computationally intensive than uh, what's currently out there. Let me just uh, move ahead. Um, so the problem is everyone's aware of today with uh, six off tracking. Uh, the best way to do it is with a visual SLAM system. That's what most people are adopting right now. And this is a camera-based SLAM where you have two cameras looking at the room and you're analyzing the scene and then trying to position yourself in it. And this is a very, very difficult problem. Everyone who's uh, addressed this knows that you're working with an uncontrolled environment, the complex lighting scenes, the situation is changing all the time. And the cameras themselves are on the headset, so you have a moving platform that's trying to image what's going on around it, and that causes motion blur, and the faster you move, the harder it is to get a, an accurate rendering of what's going on. In addition, when you're working with video cameras, you're processing massive amounts of data. You have this huge video pipeline. Uh, if you're using just a one megapixel camera at 50 frames a second, you need to crunch data of uh, 50 megabytes per second. And this typically requires dedicated hardware to do. Everyone who's implementing it today is either using a GPU or powerful processing cores in their chips. And it's a difficult way to go about it. So what we're proposing, firstly, is to reduce the amount of data that you're dealing with in order to simplify the problem. And by that, we mean instead of looking at the entire scene, we're just focusing on the light sources that are in the room. Now, typically, in any indoor environment, there's going to be some sort of lighting or some sort of high contrast feature, and that's really all you need to track off of. Uh, the second step is then to compress this data into a much simpler form. You don't need all the pixels in the camera in order to see where these light sources are. We want to compress this optically while still maintaining the directional entropy, that's the resolution in a particular axis. And then we use linear sensors to convert this data into an electrical signal. So we're basically converting a video processing problem into something more like an audio problem where instead of using megabytes of data, we're only processing kilobytes of data. Now the second thing you want to do to make this effective is to run very, very fast. Um, by capturing bright objects, like we're looking at the lights, we can easily run their sensors with very, very short shutter speeds, well below a millisecond. And that allows you to have very short exposures which allows you to get very sharp images, and that resolves the issue of the motion blur. So you can run the SLAM even while you're moving your camera at high speeds. And because you're working with these small data sets, you can iterate the SLAM very, very quickly. So we can update the pose calculation as fast as once every millisecond. And all that, what that does is that gives you the benefit that the movement between each frame is very, very small. It's a very small pose shift from one measurement to the next, so that even makes the calculations easier. So the faster you can run your SLAM, the easier it is to calculate your position and then to, to carry on to the next, next iteration. So the way we do this, conceptually, it's very simple. If you look at uh, the screen here, you see a representation of a 2D camera, a pixel array, and if you have just those two light sources that are represented there, most of the frame is useless. All you really want to know is the x and the y coordinates of these light sources. So if you were to sum up vertically and horizontally the, the pixel array, you would get that sort of one, direction, one dimensional vector on the bottom, which gives you the x position of each of the light sources. And on the left, you get that y vector, giving you the azimuth of all the light sources. And those two vectors have all the information you really need to process the data. And the scales, obviously, linearly with the resolution as opposed to quadratically. If you look at this little demo we have here of a 15 by 30 array of pixels, you're processing 450 pixels, but when you look at the two vectors, you've reduced that to just 30 plus 15, 45 pixels, so you've got a 10 times reduction in data. And as you go to larger camera sizes, you can easily get to well over a thousand fold reduction in the data. Um, but to do this electronically is inefficient. You basically would still need to take your entire camera output, run it through some FPGA summit, and run at the speed that the camera runs. So we propose to do this optically, and we've developed this little compression optic, <coughs> which is shown schematically here. There's a linear optical sensor that's just one row of pixels of the camera, and this curved uh, dome slit over it, 
And what this does, it allows light that comes from any azimuth in the room will still hit that same pixel, but light that comes from different elevations will then be directed to a different pixel along it. So what this effectively does is instantaneously gives you a one-dimensional representation in one axis of where all the light sources are without any computational overhead. And this is the small uh, prototype that we built, a commercial off-the-shelf linear sensor with one of these little uh, dome slits on it. Works very, very well, but a slit is not an effective imaging element. Uh, if you want to get high resolution, it would need to be very, very narrow. And if you want to get more light in, you need to open it up, and then you lose your resolution. So it, it showed the concept very nicely, but we then gone ahead and designed a more sophisticated optical element. This is an aspheric toroidal type lens that sits over the linear sensor and images the light at very high efficiency and at a very large angle over the room. And we prototyped this and it works quite well. So this allows us to get a very large field of view, compress the whole image down to a, a single line and extract the data that we want. Um, so uh, just to summarize the parameters of this lens a little bit, we've made lenses with 120 degree field of view, very large numerical aperture, so it collects the light effectively. It's a signal element design. We've run this over a one kilopixel sensor, just 1,000 pixels at shutter speeds of uh, well below a millisecond, even a couple of hundred microseconds. And we could run this easily at a kilohertz. And even at those speeds, the amount of data you're processing is just on the order of a megabyte per sensor. So it's very, very straightforward. Uh, we put this together in a little uh, test development board. What you see here are, is a board with three of these sensors. On the left and the right, we have these horizontal sensors that are giving us the uh, horizontal uh, azimuth of the light sources. We have two of them, so we can also do uh, triangulation for depth calculation. And then the sensor in the middle is oriented at 90 degrees, and that gives us the vertical elevation. There's a small microcontroller on this. It doesn't take a lot of processing power to capture this data. At the moment, we're just passing it off over a USB for further processing on our PC, but ultimately we imagine the whole thing can be integrated. Uh, here's some real-time data just demonstrating that we could run these things at 1,000 frames a second. So what we're showing here is just a one-axis rotation measurement uh, where we are processing on the little embedded microcontroller, capturing the data from the sensor, scanning it back and forth very, very quickly, and reading the actual angle output from the sensor out in real time at 1,000 frames a second. Uh, so we're running the whole thing on a little low power 200 micro megahertz CPU out over the USB and processing the data in real time with very, very large SKU rates. We're turning this thing at over 500 degrees a second, and we're still able to capture each frame and output the absolute orientation very, very accurately. Uh, when we feed all this into a six-off positioning system, this is very well suited to a SLAM analysis. We're running a, just a simple Kalman filter because we're running really a sparse matrix. There are very few data points that you're capturing. Uh, just those two vectors go in, so it's very easy to, to do the calculation and do the updates very, very quickly. What we do is when we capture the, the light sources, we also characterize them. It's just we sort of have this feature recognition where it's, we find the position of the light as well as certain other characteristics. We can look at the brightness, the extent of it, if it's not just a point source or if it's oriented and so on. So all that information can get fed into, into the, uh, the filter. Um, there is one issue, though, is because we've reduced uh, the entire scene just to, to line vectors. When you have multiple sources, there are possibly more than one tentative solution. It could be that a light here and a light there is actually oriented like this and like this. And you don't know that when you first look at the scene until you start moving. And then you can do the disambiguation. And very, very quickly, after just a couple of frames, you could disambiguate everything that you see and build up a true map of the room. Um, because we're reading this out at such high speeds, we also have a little IMU in the system, which is running at the same frequency. It's running at about 1,000 frames a second. And that, uh, so it's not really sensor fusion. It's just an extra input into the, uh, the SLAM filter. And because it's running at the same speed, each input frame, the uh, motion that the IMU gives you allows you to disambiguate questions even in more complex situations. And you can even then work with a single light source in your frame of in your field of view, as long as you have the IMU, it helps you disambiguate 
you know, the translation and rotational motions. Uh, some examples of what we've done with this little development board, we just pasted it on some commercial three Dolph tracking headsets. And just by getting this extra information, we can do the full six Dolph tracking. There's a, we have it running on a Samsung Gear. We have uh, over at the startup section in the exhibitor hall, we have it sitting on top of a Sony PlayStation VR. And we're doing this full six Dolph tracking just based on the lights, overhead lights there in the exhibit hall. Uh, some actual comparison data to look at the accuracy. This is comparing the output of the, the optical compressed slam with an HTC Vive lighthouse system. So we have the lighthouse set up. We actually put our board on one of the handset controllers and walked around with it and looked at the raw output of the Vive uh, from the lighthouse system and compared it to the, uh, the SLAM data. The bottom left is sort of the reconstruction, the SLAM reconstruction of the light sources that the system saw. The bottom right is the pose. And if I zoom in a little bit, you can see uh, this is the uh, heading data, the pitch roll and the yaw. The black lines are the outputs from the Vive, and the colored lines are the outputs from our own optical SLAM. And they match almost perfectly. Uh, very, very precise. In terms of the actual translational X, Y, and Z offsets, we're still seeing a little bit of offset between our measurements and what the Vive is putting out on the order of centimeters, uh, probably due to issues in uh, initial calibration and orientation of the lenses. But uh, it's still tracking the motion very, very well and very, very close. And we expect with a little bit of improvements in setup and calibration, we'll be able to track as well as the Vive and much, much faster without installing any of the the beacons that are required. In terms of the system architecture, uh, as I said, because we're running this, it's such a lightweight process, we divide it into two steps. We have a front end feature extraction and then a back end slam processing. Both of these processes have a very low memory footprint and very low processing requirements. There's no DSP required, uh, no GPU. We could implement the whole process just in fixed point arithmetic. And we've done some analysis of what we have running today, which is just sort of interpreted MATLAB code on a PC and extrapolated it down. And we see that we can easily run this whole algorithm on a single low powered core of, a, say, a Snapdragon 835 at well over 250 frames a second and uh, possibly with optimization push it up to the full potential kilohertz that it can do. Uh, so just to conclude the talk, uh, we're doing an optically compressed slam, which leverages the existing room lights as beacons in the room. So there's no need for any installation. It's uh, low cost, very low power requirements, uh, and installation free. We have a very large field of view, but in the same time maintaining a very low data bandwidth so we can track up to a kilohertz. And that then translates into total end-to-end -end latencies. Um, as low as two milliseconds, sort of one millisecond to acquire the image frame, one millisecond to do the processing and then output live position data. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? The demo that we've been doing is it's overriding it. We're just giving the full six off input and we're just running it, pumping it into a Unity engine and allowing you to do a full six off positioning rather than just relying on the uh, embedded three DOF controller. <laughs> well, it's still in development. Uh, later this year, we hope to have it sort of fully uh, engineered enough so we can start attempting to commercialize it. But later this year, thanks. Excuse me? Uh, it seems to be working with point sources for uh, the main. Yeah. Um, how does it connect with extended sources? Right. So at the moment, it is working very well with point sources. Uh, we need to do some more work on the algorithmic side of things to extend the feature recognition to deal with uh, extended light fixtures and the big fluorescent tubes or the square panels. Effectively, we would be measuring the boundaries of the light source and looking at the, the edges and then mapping those out as objects 
in the slam now, we would learn as we moved around them what the actual extent of that light source was and tracking off the edges. In principle, it will track off any high contrast object in the room, not just a light. The light source is obviously the easiest thing to look at, but windows work quite well back in our lab and door frames, anything that has a vertical or horizontal good contrast feature is easy for it to track off of. I'm sorry, the question was, uh, okay, how to track off extended sources, not just point sources. Yes? The question was, if I'm tracking high current charged edges, do I require more computing power? Uh, in principle is no. The front end would require a little more processing to understand the extent of it. But once I've defined the feature that I'm passing through to the SLAM, most of the analysis is the EKF SLAM that's running the pose calculation. And that would not change. I would just need to work a little bit more on defining what features, of, what characteristics of the uh, source or the element that I'm tracking, what it looks like to pass that through to the system. Uh, yes. Do you think this will be um, economical enough to like, have an actual, an actual, actually on your controller, maybe on your feet, and like, will it be like... You know? The question was, is this going to be economical enough to put on hand controllers and, and other places as well? It's a question of cost. The sensors themselves are fairly low cost. They're cheaper than a standard camera. They're just a linear sensor, but because we're working with three of them, and the optics, you're still talking uh, a system that would probably run you about $10 in cost of components. So I don't know if economically that would be you know, feasible. Yeah, the power consumption is quite low. Uh, where the sensors uh, are quite uh, efficient. They're lower power than a camera. Uh, we're running maybe 20 milliamps or so. But the, these typical controllers are not doing that much processing. They're just IMUs. So it would probably take more power to put this on a hand controller than just to run an IMU. I don't know how much and what sort of battery you would need. But yeah. Yes? Okay, the question was, how does this user experience compare to the existing VR tracking? Um, the short answer is that it's still a system in development. Uh, in our lab, it works very, very well. When we bring it out to sort of arbitrary lighting environments, uh, every situation has its own challenges, which we're still studying. The system builds a map of the environment on its own. It does the SLAM, so after a couple of seconds, it's located itself very, very well, and then it tracks off that, so the resolution and the accuracy that we saw is comparable to what you get with one of these commercial tracking systems. The first couple of seconds, you would want to sort of rotate back and forth, maybe take a step to the side, left or right, and allow the system to build up a map. Once you've done that, you could potentially save the map and reload it and then start up instantly if you know the environment. But if you're in a new environment, you need to do some, some sort of training. But it's usually just a couple of seconds before the system starts tracking. And while it's doing that, the IMU is giving you sort of a rough estimate of where you are, similar to the, the standard 3 off controllers. Does tracking at one kilohertz um, mean that you had a, a, a display that was running at um, one kilohertz, which is nothing that we have now? Is, is that what it means? Like, you'd be tracking that fast if you had, like, a super high, high frame rate, high hertz? Right. I don't think anybody wants to run it. The question is, is the tracking at that speed comparable to the display speeds? Nobody wants to run a display at a kilohertz. Yeah. And I, I don't think you know, the eye couldn't see it. The I, main goal here is to reduce the latency from the pose calculation. If we can do the entire pose calculation in one to two milliseconds, we can provide that input to the rendering engine quicker without having to do some guesswork about where you're going to be in 20 or 30 milliseconds to sort of render the pose. So it is as faster, it would be much faster than the display. It's just to sort of reduce the overall pipeline. That's the main benefit.